Hi, everyone. Welcome to Brain Talks. I'm Deborah Khan, founder of Being Patient. Today, um, we are so pleased to announce that we have one of the world's leading expert advisors on caregiving, uh, Tipa Snow, joining us from Cincinnati. Um, Tipa has a lot of experience, um, and what I love about her research is she uh, really studies the physical changes in the brain um, with dementia and um, advises on the best behavioral approach. It's, it's an area that's incredibly difficult for a lot of us uh, who have loved ones with dementia. So Tipa, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, my pleasure. It's great to be here. And I love what you're doing. Um, that outreach is so necessary. It's called translation. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so I want to first start with um, a term that you've coined positive approach to care. Um, tell us what exactly that means. Yeah. So when we talk about people's brains dying, I mean, we can get real into the downside of that. I mean, and people's brains are dying. I can't stop it. I can't even halt it. And in reality, I can't even slow down the deaths of brain cells. I mean, I can't personally. What I can do is help you use what you have left at any moment in time. So as long as you have something left, I feel like it's my job if I'm going to work with you and try to do things with you to use what you have um, and not to ask you for what you don't have in that moment, whether it's chemical or whether it's structural. So if you say to me, listen, I don't know who you are, rather than saying, well, I'm your daughter. Who do you think I am? Which is sort of a natural sort of reaction to that, because it's like, well, how could you not know who I am? But to hear in that moment, wow, you've lost who I am to you. Um, so say you're not sure who I am. So if you say to me, I don't know who you are, rather than reacting to it in your head, go, whoa, lost in place and time, not sure of me. OK, you're not sure who I am. So do I look familiar or do I not look familiar to you? Well, you look familiar. Well, that's good. So do I seem friendly? Because that's really important. Well, yeah, I mean, you seem friendly. Two, we're on two, two good things. Um, have the, do you recognize my voice at all? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm somebody who loves you. My name's Tipa. Oh, and if the person goes, oh, well, isn't that odd? Because my daughter's name is Tipa. Then what I have to be willing to let go of, if I'm going to be with you, really be with you where you are, is the idea you're not doing this on purpose. In your mind, you see a Tipa and it's not me. And I'm also named Tipa, but I'm not that person yet because you can't get to the memory that links me to me. So I could say, wow, that is interesting. So now let me ask you something. Is she a good kid or does she get in trouble? Oh, she's great. <laughs> so I, she still hasn't found me, but I have to be willing to be with her and say, well, that's interesting. So let me ask you something. Is there anything that while I'm here, I could help you with? Let go of the idea that in this moment, she's going to know who I am to her. And is it really important? Well, yeah, it hurts. But is it really important in this moment that she be accurate about who I am? Or did I really come so that I could be with her for a little bit? And the fact that she can't figure out who I am, can I let that part go and still be with her? Or can and I not? Yeah. And what the mean signals is, um, you know, I've noticed with my own mom that um, it seems like a lot of her EQ, her emotional intelligence is still on cue, although her memory um, gets worse. And mm -hmm. I, I was wondering, and I often think about this, and I think this is part of what um, your technique um, highlights is, you know, people with Alzheimer's can still feel things. They can oh, still yeah. feel emotion. And so if if we were to say, you don't remember me, I'm your daughter. I mean, that's that would hurt. Well, that's not, why would, you're not my daughter. My daughter would never act like that. And so what's happening is your behavior is atypical for my daughter. 
And it is because you were so blown out of the water that I don't know who you are. And the idea of taking that and and pushing it down and moving it off to the side, not forgetting it because you don't, you don't forget it. So here's, here's a reality check. You will need a timeout at some point and you need somebody to go talk to about what I just did because I didn't do it on purpose. But at the, at the same time, you're not going to be able to let it go without processing that because your brain did take it and it dealt with it in the moment because you get it, how important it is to be there for me um, and to not react to me. It doesn't help us because I get hurt, you get hurt, and this just makes it harder for us to do the things we need to do with each other. Like, so, do you really think in that moment I'm going to be willing to take a shower with somebody I don't like? Right. No. So how how much do we know about emotions and the emotional capability of a person who has Alzheimer's? I mean, obviously, um, it differs according to what stage they are in at the time. But from your experience and your research, um, how much of that emotional capability stays present? Um, in, in other words, how much do they feel uh, in terms of hurt and love uh, throughout the course of this disease? Yeah, now this is where it gets a little tricky because it now also depends on the type of dementia. In other words, what parts of the brain are being attacked? Um, for instance, if the person has a frontal temporal lobe dementia, where the front of the brain and the temporal lobe are being attacked, they have a higher risk of losing the ability to have emotional connectedness because that's mediated by the prefrontal cortex. So I can't show you what I'm feeling because I, I've lost the way of doing that. So I could say to you, well, I'm very sad about that idea that you don't know me. I don't, you, I don't know one of us, I don't know. I don't know the thing I know about you. I don't know. It's not right. And you can see I'm confused, but it's hard to see my level of distress because I've lost that ability to express it. Or in some dementias like frontal temporal, I might not feel it. I'm not feeling the emotion the same way I would have because the part of my brain that allows me to feel emotion is actually being flattened. And so that flat affect is part of my dementia. But for Alzheimer's, that's not the case. People who live with Alzheimer's are frequently more released into emotion. And I, I don't know why you're so mad at me. Why are you mad? And you'll say, well, I'm not mad, mom. I'm just frustrated. Well, you look mad. Look at your eyes. Look at how they're all squinty at me. You think this is funny? Because what I saw for a second was just your your lips doing your lips just did that and my eyes picked it up because I'm very focused on visuals and I'm trying to figure things out. And that sometimes makes me intense because I'm so, I have a very tunnel vision of what's going on and I can't see big picture. So this is something that I catch myself doing um, a lot, which is, you know, I have to stop myself. I've learned and I've gotten much better saying, oh, you don't remember because it's just kind of a natural thing. Oh, we just talked about that 10 minutes ago. You don't remember? Yeah. Tell us a little bit about the impact of saying you don't remember to somebody suffering from Alzheimer's disease. Yeah. So the part of my brain that's damaged is the hippocampus. And the hippocampus is the part that takes a piece of data, locks it in, and then has it. And so when I say to you, so what time is my doctor's appointment? And you say, you can give me an answer, whatever the answer is. Make one up. Four o'clock. Today? Yes. Oh, okay. Well, I wish you'd said something about it. That's your cue to recognize. You've got to recognize in that 
It's on the calendar, mom. I mean, you, we put it on the calendar. We just had this conversation. This is that moment where you have to realize if you're going to be helpful, I'm missing a, I'm missing a, a file cabinet that's marked what's happening today. And even though we went over it multiple times, every time you say it, and then I say, oh, four o'clock, you put it in your file cabinet again. And Lord, we've been in and out of that file cabinet multiple times, but my file cabinet got stolen. And so although I thought I filed it, when I look, there's no file cabinet. So I don't hold on to it. So every time I'm asking, the reality is I don't have it. I just don't have it. Now, the interesting thing is you and I use what's called working memory and immediate recall. But that's where people with Alzheimer's, that's the part that they're missing. They don't have working memory. It's getting shorter and less. So I used to be able to do five to eight and then it was five and then it was three. And now it's just there's something about an appointment. So, the, so the, correct answer, the correct answer would be, so the correct answer is actually a little bit more than that. So the correct answer is first to let you know I got your question. You'd say you're wanting to know what time the appointment is. Confirm the receipt of the information. So you've got to slow it down even more and say you're wanting to know what time your appointment is because it pauses me. It gives me a chance to realize she's asking me this question. And she's asking me this question evidently because she didn't get it. So let me say what, the, what I heard her say, because when she's talking, she's not listening to herself. She doesn't even realize exactly what she's asked. So I say, you want to know what time your appointment is? It's at four o'clock. Now, what did I change? You, you a visual cue. I added a visual cue, a very strong visual cue, and I do it with my hand. It's at four o'clock right near my face. And I show it to her. So, oh, I gave her the data. I gave it to her, but in just verbal format, I gave it to her in visual format. And then I say, oh, hey, mom, I have a favor to ask of you. Did I give her the thing she asked for? If we've been over it five or six times, then either she's not got the file cabinet to put it in, or she's a little distressed about this thing we're doing. And that's making it really hard for her brain to hold on to the details because this doctor's appointment or this appointment has her a little revved up. And that says, you know what, I'm not getting anything in that cabinet until this appointment's over. I mean, it's just not gonna stick. So what I'll do is interject. Oh, hey mom, I have a favor to ask. Now what happens when I say that with energy? What happened to you? Oh, I have a favor to ask you. Yeah, That's but, positive. Oh. It is, but your whole brain went, yes, because okay. now you're ready to catch the ball. And what happened to you sending me the message? You dropped it. Because yeah. you, know, you can really only do one thing at a time. So I said, would you do me a favor? I'm trying to remember back when I was a kid and you took us to the zoo. Do you remember which animals I seem to like the best? Now, what I did is transition us from immediate recall. To long term. To long term. And these are stories you told me about going to the zoo and which animals I like. So I have to use my memory of us to help you find another place where we can go and be together, where you get to be smart. And that's empowering, right? I mean, it's instead of, oh, you don't remember, you don't remember, you don't remember, which is a reminder, I have this terrible brain disease. It's more positive. And, and it's anxiety provoking when I can't remember things. It's like, I can't trust my brain. Oh crap, Absolutely. you told me that already? Why can't I hold on to that? <sighs> so and instead, yeah, it's very different. Absolutely. So I have a question about perception. I've heard you talk about this before too. Um, and I've noted with my mom when I'm driving in a car and she's a passenger, she gets particularly, she, 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 ha she has a lot of anxiety telling me how to drive, what to do. Um, 
And I, it occurred to me after listening to you talk about how an Alzheimer's person with Alzheimer's sees things that she, her vision is, is probably quite distorted in the car that's making her paranoid of something. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about, unpack that for me. Um, yeah. What is it, what is she seeing that is not really happening? Because, it, it, you know, it, it's so bad that, you know, you're cu you're coming to a very slow stop at a stop sign. She's like, oh my God, stop, stop, right? Yeah. But tell me what's happening inside her brain. Yeah. What's cool. That? That's really important. So what's happening is who used to drive the car? She did. Who was in charge of everything about that car? Absolutely. And she so was. now she's been disempowered with her hands and her foot and her judgment. But you, she's still in a front seat. And her brain sort of gets it and can't hold on to it. So at this point, um, her brain is damaged enough that visual data is coming in. But her view of the world has gone from about taking in this much data to taking in this much data to now taking in this much data. And so stuff is coming streaming by her really quick. And if she looks at it, then she loses the front. And so she then looks at the front. It's like, oh, shit, stoplight. And, and she's like, oh, 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 it's coming really fast because she got distracted for a few seconds at trying to, what was that? And things are going by so quickly that if she tries to isolate on one object or one thing, and then she real, her brain goes, oh, but you're supposed to pay attention to the front because that's the rule. And so, then she doesn't have anything to control. There's nothing, her foot can't control anything and and then she's like oh, you can just stop and so it's just throw your hands at the dashboard and try to make cars you're panicky so would you drive it if you can visualize it would it be like tunnel vision but with things coming in at you yeah and if you were to put your hands around your tunnel like if you do it right now and i shove my hand at the thing it feels like i'm gonna hit your brain knows that I'm on the other end. There's no way I could do it. I'm not even in the same space as you. But with only tunnel vision, that thing seems to be approaching really rapidly. And when I have no way to stop us, what I have to do is rely on. But if I turn to look at you, then I lose track of what's out in front of me. Because if I turn to you, oh, my God, you could crash. So she's always been in control. So for her to look away from the front to you, oh my God, I'm gonna lose it. And she doesn't have a way to stop anything from happening other than yelling. Now that's what is being triggered is the primitive brain's desire to be safe. And it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Oh God, oh geez, geez, just a slow, slow, slow down, slow down. Oh geez, you're going, you're going, you're going. And, and it's almost stuttery and uh, holding her breath and becoming quite distressed and loud where, oh, <laughs> not being able to get sound out either direction. Um, it's a preserved chunk of brain in the right temporal region, which is the rhythm section, but it's also the forbidden word section, and it's also the intensity frequency section, and it's also where music, poetry, and prayer are located. So I want to ask you this question in a different way, which is... Um, these are great strategies. I can completely understand why it would make the person with Alzheimer's feel so much better. Um, but as we know, um, they have very limited short-term memory. So it's gonna happen over and over again, and we're gonna have to employ these same strategies over and over again. What does it do for the caregiver? I mean, the caregivers are really suffering in all of this, right? Yeah, so yeah. What does it do for them? Well, now all of a sudden they're empowered too because they can change the direction. So rather than answering that question 16 times after the first five, I now have a way to move us out of that place. And when you say, you know what, um, I'm going to put the brakes on now. Oh, jeez, we've got to slow it down, don't we? Yeah, I was going sort of fast. I am so sorry. 
the idea that I have ways to chill you down empowers me because otherwise your emotion coming at me, it's like, mom, we're fine. And I'll yell back at you, which I don't mean to do, but my brain gets triggered by your distress brain and the two of us mount in distress. And so, hey, I, I say, hey, mom, and I actually know how to take your hand and give it a little pump. So I release oxytocin and I go, you know, I love you, right? And what I do is I put some music on that she likes to sing along with and we're singing together and her brain goes from visual input to auditory input. And all of a sudden, both of us are less stressed out. That is a really, really great advice. And I admit I am 100% guilty of all of those things that you said we shouldn't do. <laughs> you can't help it sometimes. Well, you can't get better if you don't know what the better is. All you can do is what you, you know how to do. And when you shot your wad, you shot your wad and you're still in the car with her. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, so tell us, um, I'm curious. I mean, there's so many, there's so many, many stages ages of this disease and so much of it um, impacts interaction and how we interact with our loved ones and behavior. But I get this question a lot. Um, and I, I want to ask you this because a lot of people who turn to us, it's in that initial stage of, oh, mm -hmm. my mom or dad's memory isn't what it used to be. When should I worry about that? And the, I think that's actually a crucial point. It's a crucial turning point because, you know, we all first um, dismiss it as, oh, it's mild cognitive impairment. It's part of aging. And then you reach this point where you think, oh, there's something uh -huh. else there. Yeah. Right. And I actually think that's the turning point in a relationship from a daughter acting more like a mother to her parent or parenting her mother. Right. So tell us a little bit about how to deal, because we get this question all the time. How do you deal with that initial stage where yeah. the person is cognitively very capable and will be for, you know, a, a years, a couple of years to come or even more in some cases? How do you deal with that? Well, one of the things I think we don't do is help us establish baselines on ability and make that a conversation so that we can start checking things regularly without having to go to some official person. So, you know, like, hey, mom, I just did something and it said this would be a really good idea is to go ahead and do um, this thing every every six months. And we're just going to check on it. So if something changes, we'll notice right away and we could get everything double checked to make sure there's nothing new or different going on, like you're not getting diabetes or your thyroid's not out of whack or something funky going on. And it's, it's pretty simple. I use animal fluency as my quick check. And I say, what we're going to do is each of us is going to name as many animals as we can think of. And I'll keep track of the time. And we're going to put it on and we're actually going to record it, audio, record it. And now how many did you get? Let's listen. Yep, yep. Wow, 50. Whoa, mom, you are pretty amazing. Let me do it. We each do it. And then six months later, we do it. What we shouldn't see is a huge shift in numbers. We shouldn't see a decrease. So one of the things I think what you're reflecting is that place where we let it go and we let it go and we let it go. And then we have to have a conversation about it but one of us may or may not know that it's a really critical conversation because we haven't had a really significant conversation. We've just like, yeah, I think that's pretty normal. I mean, or maybe not normal, but you know, it's not a problem yet. And we let it go without having those opportunities because when I want to have a conversation is before we ever get to that place. But if we haven't opened the door for that kind of mom, what do you think about, how your brain has been doing lately on it you know do you think it's still great do you think it's sort of you're not sure or are you worried because if we don't have these conversations and then let's do our animals again and notice the real difference in cadence or notice that this time when I do it instead of listing animals I go I don't know why you're asking me to do this this is just this seems like this is beyond what needs to be done I can go see a doctor and what it tells you is, whoa, I'm 
getting really defensive about something. I'm hiding it. Um, so mom, you think you should go see a doctor. We shouldn't do this. Wow, this is really different for me. You know, tell me about what's going on for you because I'm, I'm concerned that our relationship is shifting a little bit because you're seeing me as getting bossy because I didn't mean to be bossy. I was trying to do the things we've done before. Well, I know, but I don't want to do it anymore. Okay. You're not wanting to do it. Talk to me about that. So in other words, we, I think we skip the step of talking about the first shifts with I have awareness or I don't have awareness of my change. And that's in the prefrontal cortex. That's my anisognosia if I don't have awareness. And agnosia, I do have awareness of my shift and I'm anxious because I do notice it and I want to talk about it or I don't. Okay, I, I want to get to some questions that are coming in, um, and this is a common one um, that pretty much anyone who's taking care of someone with um, Alzheimer's uh, has this experience. And, and this question is, what is the best way to handle my mother's paranoia about someone having been in her home while she's sleeping mm -hmm. and moving her things around? And also, I can add to that stealing, right? There, that, yeah, stealing and moving, yeah. Stealing and moving, like, so <laughs> my house and stole all my clothes and I don't oh have my gosh, so they stole your clothes well that's not good so the first thing is what I did before which is to validate your concern so the first thing I need to do is hear the words and the concern you're expressing and so wow so somebody came in the house and stole or you they moved things around well that's not okay so now you were sleeping and tell me a little more about that so the next phrase is, tell me more about it. Because I actually want them to let out the fear or the anger or whatever it is. I need to hear a little more of what actually their brain says happened. Because I want to know how far off what I know to be the case happened. How far away from where I think we are is my mom right now. Um, she thinks people are coming in here. And I said, so you think somebody came in and took all the clothes out of the closet and put them in suitcases? Wow, that is really weird that somebody would do that. I wonder, wonder what they were thinking, taking everything and putting it in the suitcases. Well, mom, I am so sorry that happened. What that should not be happening. I'm going to hang these clothes back. Up. This is ridiculous. And you know what? This needs to get looked into. Let me see what I can do about it. How about, could you give me a hanger? Great. Here, let's get these hung back up. Now, what I didn't do is, mom, let's be real. You're the one who took them. I don't know why you're taking everything out of the closet. Mom, you want to explain that to me? Why are you taking things out and putting them in suitcases? Well, I didn't do that. Who do you think did it? You know, I'm letting go of that idea because her brain doesn't remember Truly, it doesn't remember packing those clothes, hiding those clothes, taking those clothes and putting them somewhere. Her brain thinks clothes have been stolen because she thinks she's in another place in time. She's in a different part of her life where I had different clothes in the closet. Somebody came in here and replaced all my good clothes with this shit. And then she actually <laughs> swears. And it's like, holy moly, what's going on here? And it's like her brain actually thinks somebody's trying to trick her. Okay, wait, let me throw this one at you. We talked earlier about giving a visual cue about, you know, four and the hand signal. Mm -hmm. What about, what if you had a camera and you could, uh, installed, and you could prove that nobody entered the house? Is is that good visual reinforcement? Or no, because it's history. It's, it's history. history. And history, you can try, and but then what will tend to happen is, so nobody came in here. Why did I think somebody came in here then? What's wrong with me? Why am I thinking this stuff? Am I losing it? Am I not so? Are you going to put me somewhere? Because when I realized, because some people do have awareness, when I realize I cannot actually remember something that I see on camera, it's like, oh my Lord, how could I... How could I have done that and not remembered it? <gasps> I can't trust myself. And what you do is you cook your own goose. And I mean that in a 
in sort of a real way, because now if I can't trust my brain, well, whose brain can I trust? ring a ling ling ring a ling ling ring a ling ling Sweetheart, can you come over here? I thought I heard somebody, but I know when I hear people, I don't really, they're not really there. Will you come over and check? Because I don't get it right. You know that. So now we're going to be at my house a lot. <laughs> In the okay, middle of the night. <laughs> we, have, uh, we have great questions coming in. Uh, another one coming in um, is from a viewer who says, my mom is now nonverbal. She seems mm -hmm. so sad and distressed. How can I help her find some peace? That's a great question. It is a great question. So let's go over on the side of the brain that still has auditory input, but it won't be language. So... I want to start where she is. So if she's, oh, oh, then the first thing I want to do is take her hand in a, in a hold that's called hand under hand. It's right hand to right hand, but it's clasping in like a soul shape. Uh, and it's really powerful because it takes and puts pressure. Our hands are both free, but we've clasped our hands and with, with a pad to pad contact, it actually causes stress reduction um, and maybe you can show a picture at some point but I don't have anybody with me to do it with um, I do have photos of it but what I want to do is go oh 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 mom mom now it really helps to know some of the songs that gave her comfort and rhythms that were comfortable and comforting to her so for my mom it would have been Oh, oh, and I would go, oh, oh, dear, what could the matter be, dear me? What could the matter be, oh, dear, what could the matter be, me so long at the fair? Da, 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 and I pick up the rhythm and we and my mom literally would open her eyes, smile, and start humming along, even though she was quote unquote nonverbal. But I had to find the right way to open the window because the door doesn't work anymore. Um, but finding my way in requires both patience and also an assurance that rubbing across the back with a rhythm, rocking, humming along, and if she's ah, on a tabletop, I come along and go, I'll pick up a rhythm and then transform it into something that's upbeat, up energy rather than downbeat, down energy. But I got to start with whatever she gives me. And I've got to be willing to be where she is first to help her come out of that place where she's stuck. I, I have to say, like, even listening to that made me feel better. It's like there's something comforting and soothing about it. So I, I could totally yeah. understand how, I mean, and, and what's so wonderful about what you are telling us is there is, there is still a way in. Like you there can is. get there even yeah. at a later stage and yeah. employing these brings the person who we love out. Right. And they do. and they can only stay there for just a few seconds. But the chemistry, what you did is you changed the chemistry of their brain, um, literally changed the chemistry of their brain and a part that wasn't firing fired up. It's still in there. And so once that fires up literally for a few seconds, sometimes people can say, I love that song. And you go, me too. Amazing lady taught it to me. So I have, um, I have a lot of questions coming in. Let's, I, I, I'm going to speed it up a teeny bit so we can get to some of them. Um, so we have another question from a viewer saying, um, what do you think about permanent treatment of dementia patients with neuro, uh, neuroleptics? My mom has FTD and has had to take them so she can stay on in the nursing home. <laughs> I think what we've done is create prisons for people um, and we can either chemically restrain them or physically restrain them. And sometimes we do both because quite honestly, 
there are a lot of locations that claim to be dementia care um, facilities, agencies, organizations that actually don't do much training and they don't have much skill and they don't employ much skill. What they have are locked secured units um, and medications and staff that try their very best with very little training. And I think until we as a society and or, or as a nation um, say, you know what? People living with dementia deserve better. Um, they actually deserve to be cared for by people who have been trained to do this thing called dementia care. And it's actually fairly complicated. It's it's not rocket science, but there is a science and an art to it. And people deserve better than they're getting. Uh, we often use medications to dull people down so that they feel less and they can respond less so that they or react less so that we can get away with stuff that we shouldn't be doing the way we're doing because you or I wouldn't tolerate it. But because someone has dementia, we indicate that it's because they have dementia that they act like this. But I would ask you, if I just walked up to you and started to pull your dress up and say, I'm going to help you get changed, what do you think your immediate reaction to that would be? Embarrassment. And what would you try to do? Just get the person away. Well, or would you try to push your dress back down and then I'll tug your dress up and you pull your dress down and then I call a second person to hold you so that I can get this done? I mean, in any other situation, we get that that's an unacceptable way to treat a human being, except when people have dementia. And then we allow things because, well, I can't get her to do it either. And it's like, I get that. But there is a way to get her to do this that does not require her to feel like we're abusing. And it has to do with linking my hands and my brain with her and showing her, so turning to the side and pointing to me and then to her and saying, you, you're going to do this. Here, you pull your pants up, pull your dress up, but I have my hands with your hands. And so we're both pulling it up and your brain goes, oh, pull my dress up. Well, sure, I know how to do that. And because I'm not right in front of you blocking you in, it doesn't feel like an attack on you. It feels like you're doing it and I'm here to support you. And with limited vision, they have binocular vision. They can't take in but this much data. That's it. Then I've eliminated the threat and the person can do it. So there's a lot of potential. We just aren't really realizing potential. So until we change some other things, neuroleptics, unfortunately, <clears throat> for frontal lobe dementia um, is way too often what people use because they don't know what to do. I um, we have another question of the viewer who says, um, wh "What about people who are deaf who can no longer hear? Is there um, is there a way of communicating? Is it is it the same as we talked about before, the hand holding and the rocking?" Yes, and it is also. Great. We've got to get really visually oriented, and I need to be willing to pick up and bring with me. Two things, one for me and one for you, so that when I hold it up, I hand you one while I show you what we're going to do with it. But I've got to get a lot better at props and cues and visuals, because if you're deaf, I've got to get more jazz handy, but not random. It all needs to be. And then I show you that whatever I want to show you is here. And now we look at it. Together. But I've got to eliminate. I need to get out of the habit of using very many words. And I've got to. Ooh. That is. So. Tifa, this is so helpful, and I want to thank you for offering us so much. I, I, I want to end, though, on what do you advise caregivers for their own health? I mean, we hear so many people suffering um, because of the stress of caregiving. So mm -hmm. 
what is your advice to caregivers? I mean, the, the communication helps hugely, but what about for their own health? So I try to do things in sets of five because people can hold on to five things. Um, the first is you need enough sleep. <clears throat> and if you're not getting decent sleep or you're not getting enough sleep or you're finding your sleep is being interrupted, that's a very high risk for emotional distress. And so getting sleep really matters. The second is don't be a lone ranger. We got to get out of this lone ranger business and we've got to form connections. We've got to reach out and find people who will support us. And I'm going to tell you that out of every five families, four of them fall apart before this disease is over. Four families fall apart. Only one in fives pulls together. So very frequently, the people you think are going to be your supports are not your supports. So you're going to need to reach out for somebody who does support you. You need support. You need somebody to go to. When I said, you know, you got to not react to me when I say, I don't know who you are. What are you doing here? You can respond to me, but then you need a place to go and grieve the loss of your mother. And you deserve that support. You've got to get it. So when you come back to me, you're not carrying the baggage of that loss of me because I'm right here. I'm just not how I was. The third is that you actually are going to need to really de-stress. You've got to look at what's stressing you out and either learn some new things, which is helpful, or let go of some things that you're not able to do and shift those off to somebody else. So it's either letting go of things you're not feeling particularly skilled at. You don't have to become the thing for everybody. You're not a lone ranger. So either build your skill or let go of some things and give it to somebody else. So hand it off. And then the next thing is what are you eating and drinking? Because invariably, one of the things that we do as care partners, caregivers, is we start to shortchange ourselves and we get empty and we eat for comfort or we don't eat at all. We drink because I've got to stay awake. So I'm drinking more caffeine or I'm drinking something with sugar in it or I'm, I'm trying to give myself a little boost, that little kick. And I'm really getting into bad habits of eating stuff that's not good for me, drinking too much of things that aren't good for me. I'm not hydrated and I'm not well nourished. And I've got to take care of my nourishment and my hydration in a reasonable fashion. And the last is I need to get out, out and exercise. I don't mean a hardcore wear myself out, but I need to get out and see things that give me pleasure, hear things that give me joy. I need to give myself permission to get recharged. And it needs to be in an active way, not in a passive go out and sit. Yes, that's fine. Rest a little bit. But we need to get out and get moving. We need to engage in a way that gives us that boost that brings us back energized. But I really can't thank you enough for the work you do and your incredible way of explaining things to us. I mean, what you say makes so much sense and I feel completely enlightened and I, I really want to thank you for your work. How do we let people know? I mean, if people want to know more about advice from TIPA, where do they go? TIPASnow.com. My name is weird that it's the easiest thing to do a website with. So TIPASnow.com and we have all kinds of free YouTubes and video clips and things like that on there. It's not like, you know, we have a free journal also. Um, and I know you guys do an amazing job. And again, we're another resource that if you're doing this, you need to know about it because there's just not enough resources out there that are practical. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, Tipa. Thank you so much for your time, your sage advice. And uh, we look forward to staying in touch. I'm sure we're going to get more questions online. Um, we can re redirect people to your site or maybe, uh, you know, if send them on to you uh, for answers at, at a later time. Thank sure. you so much. You are so welcome. Thanks for the opportunity and thanks for what you do. Okay. And you too. We'll speak soon. Bye -bye.